this morning before we continue our time of Advent. Would you just join your hearts with mine as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father God, Lord, we thank you for loving us. Lord, we thank you that you sent Jesus Christ to be born of a virgin, to live a sinless life and die on that old rugged cross. God, I pray this morning as we continue just to celebrate the time of the birth of Christ. Father, that you would just help us remember your love. God, help us to see it in your word, Father, that we might bless you for that love you've given us, God, that we might show that love to other people. We thank you, Father, for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, today we're going to learn about loving the world or love for the world, God's love that he has. And as we do this, let's begin with our time of Advent. Right, Advent is this time of preparation or this time of anticipation of Messiah, of our Savior. So as we think about the time of anticipation, preparation, we, we began lighting the first candle and we, we talked about hope for a Savior. Right, and so as we light the candle, we remember that even going back in the Old Testament, God had a plan. And as we think about God's plan, we always look forward to what God has. And we saw in the Old Testament, these, these guys, they, they said, I, I, I hope for Messiah. I know of God the Father, but I know he's, he's promised us something bigger and he's coming for us. Today, we know Jesus Christ has come the first time he's died on the cross. We have hope of the return of Jesus Christ. Amen. We are expectant of Christ's return so that once for all he can gather his own to himself. The next week, the second candle of Advent, we learned about a time of preparation for Jesus coming. During the time of preparation, we, we say to God, we, we hope for your coming. We are preparing ourselves now. As John the Baptist cried out in the wilderness, prepare ye, make way for the, the coming of the Lord. We prepare ourselves. Right? We, we, we take this time of Christmas, and though we involve ourselves in giving for missions, as we involve ourselves in loving others and uh, different Christmas festivities, we shouldn't forget that this is a time when I come before God and I say, God, make my heart right that I might worship you fully, that I might, and this is the third point, remember the joy that Christ brings as we prepare ourselves before Christ, we can truly experience his joy. You know, the, the joy of Christ is only really completed when we're living for Jesus Christ. And in your life, what you'll experience is times of maybe straying a little from the will of Christ, but as you directly follow Christ because you prepared yourself for him, you experience this joy of God that nothing else can compare to. The joy that Christ brings this season, we all should have in our hearts. Today, the fourth candle, the fourth candle, the can candle of love or the angel candle. <clears throat> this is this is the time of that Christmas season where we take just a step back and we say, God, we, we understand that you sent Jesus Christ because you love us. The angels proclaimed this love. We have a couple verses I want you to read with me or look at with me. In Luke chapter 2, the angels, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Because today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Coupled with John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. We remember the love that God has for us in Christ. Today, God loved the world. And as we think about this for our learning from God's word, we're going to build on the text of the Advent on that passage of John 3.16. And, and I want you to learn today just, just the love that God has for you. When we think about Christmas and we think about all that it means, it all is propelled for this, or propelled by this love that God has given to us. In the third chapter of the book of John, we're going to read verses 14 through 18, but, but as, we, as we get here, as you turn here to, 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 to John and your, your copy of God's Word, 
Let me set the stage. John chapter 3, this guy comes to Jesus. His name is Nicodemus. And he's coming to Jesus and he's asking Jesus what he must do to be saved. And Jesus begins to talk to him, but, but there's something curious that you won't answer or you won't notice in your English translations. Jesus begins speaking to Nicodemus. And he sp speaks to Nicodemus uh, specifically. Nicodemus, 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 why are you not understanding these things? You are a teacher of the law. But then in verse 12, he switches from the you, Nicodemus, to the plural you. Right? Significant because what we hear in the story is Jesus is just talking to this one guy. But why does Jesus then switch from speaking to one person to you, plural? I'll tell you why. It's because what Jesus is doing is he's saying, I've got a message for you, Nicodemus, but really it's for all of you. In your English translations, it doesn't translate because we don't have a plural you. Unless you all, y'all, y'all, y'all are from Texas. <laughs> But what I want you to see today is that the message that was for Nicodemus, Jesus specifically opens up to the world so that we might know his love. Beginning in verse 14 of the third chapter of the book of John, Jesus says to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the, serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Because God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. Amen and amen. May the Lord add the blessing of the reading of his word. The first point I want you to get here is look and live. Look, God, God loves the world and he loves the world so much that he wants to make it easy for us to believe. God wants to make it easy for you to go to heaven. As we look in the world, some some different religions and different groups of people have made salvation all about working for something. Like if you just do this or that or the other thing, or if you just give enough or you just do the right things in the right order, then God's going to love you. But what God says is, I love you. Just look to me for salvation. Jesus, as he speaks to us and Nicodemus at the same time in verses 14 and 15, he says, just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And what he's doing is he's wanting us to look back into Numbers chapter 21. And Moses lifted up the serpent. Let me, let me turn back there. You can turn back with me if you want. I'm going to read just a few verses from number 21. I want you to see where Jesus is going here. In Numbers 21, verse 4, you see the people are with Moses. And as they're going, the people, they become impatient, the word says, on the way into verse 4. And the people spoke out against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out in Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water. We loathe this worthless food. Speaking of God's provision, they say. Verse 6, the Lord sent fiery serpents to judge the people among the people. They bit the people so that many of Israel died. And people came to Moses. They said, we have sinned. For we've spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole. Everyone who's bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and he would live. You see in the story of Israel that correlates or parallels our story with Jesus Christ. What happens is the people are in the wilderness. And they don't understand it until they cry out to God, God, why did you do this to me? In other words, what they were doing is rebelling against God. The rebellion of God's people leads to God's judgment. You know, the same is true in my life and in yours. I've rebelled against God and we, we call that rebellion sin. And whenever we realize our sin, we cry out to God, God, help 
us. Just like these Israelites cried out, God, help us. And God said to Moses, Moses, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put a snake on a pole and tell the Israelites God's grace is extended to you this way. Look at the pole as an admission of your guilt, your faith in me, and you'll be healed. So Moses does it, right? He puts the snake on a pole. And can you imagine the reaction in the camp? There's that old guy who's saying, I, I've been with Moses long way. There's no way I'm going to do what that guy says. I don't believe in snakes on poles. That's ridiculous. There's a young person who says, I was bit, but I believe God because I've seen what he's done. And he's running just so he can look at the pole and look, bam, he's healed. God's forgiven the transgression. In our life, it's the same way we look at Jesus. Jesus must also be lifted up. You see, in verse 14, as, 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 as Jesus continues, he says in the same way that the Son of Man must be lifted up. Why? So that whoever would look upon him would similarly be saved. God God has given us this such a simple, simple gospel, right? You've sinned, you've rebelled against me, but I love you. And so I sent my son so that he might be on the cross and he's lifted up, which is to say crucified. And anybody who would look at Christ can live. The question, though, is just like in Israel, where there's going to be that guy who's saying, you know, look, I, Moses, that's crazy. Surely I've got to do something. And he's wrapping something around his leg. He's saying, hey, would you, I got bit back here. Would somebody suck this out? <laughs> there's poison. Hurry. <laughs> you, we do the same crazy stuff with our salvation today. Trying to work for something that we can never earn. Jesus is the only way. So much here, you know, we, we think sometimes about salvation and we get our American modern logic going and we say, you know, I, there's got to be another way. And we try to, we try to philosophize about how, how, how this could be it or that could be it. And then we've got people who say, well, there's, there's many roads that lead to heaven. But what God says is there's one way. Just like for Israel, there was one snake on one pole. There's one Christ on one cross, and no other way leads to heaven. This is why mission is so important. The reason that we give so graciously to missions is because we see Jesus is the only way to heaven. God's word is clear about this. Acts chapter 4, verse 11, the stone despised by you builders who has become the cornerstone, Jesus. There is salvation in no one else in verse 12, for there is no other name under heaven given to a people by which we must be saved. Paul wrote in Galatians 2.21, I do not frustrate the grace of God because if righteousness could come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Jesus says, John 14, 6, I'm the way, truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This morning, just like Israel, people had to realize their sin. They had to obey God and his salvation, looking on the snake to receive grace of God. It's the same for us. This morning, look, I don't know where you are, but I know it's Christmas time, and this is what Christmas is all about, the salvation that God has brought us in Jesus Christ. What that means by way of application is very simply this. First, we admit our rebellion to God. Because just like in Israel when they were bit by the snakes, the same is true with us. Those who say, I've not rebelled, I'm not going to look at the snake, are the same ones saying, God, I've not sinned. I'm not going to look to Christ. Only when we understand that we've rebelled against God. Can we believe that God has sent Jesus to save us? We could talk about the logic of Jesus Christ. Look, I could tell you there are tens of thousands of ancient manuscripts of God's word, and they're all exactly the same. Like, seriously, there is no other text on earth anywhere 
that even comes close to rivaling the accuracy and the, the, the security that we have in the Word of God. But intellectually knowing these things doesn't get us saved. It's this belief that we have in our heart. Believing that Jesus is the Son of God that came, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, that died on that old rugged cross, ascended into heaven. That is by, that is what we do for salvation. And then what? Look. Look on the cross and live, which simply means, God, forgive me. Lord, I'm trusting Jesus to take my place on that old rugged cross. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. This brings us to that famous verse 16 in the book of John. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would, would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Look, we, we talk about Nicodemus so that we can get to verse 16 so we can understand that love motivates Christmas or salvation, right? Because Christmas is our salvation. Without the cradle, there would be no cross. Love motivated God saying, I'm going to send Jesus Christ, my only begotten, in order that the world could be saved. A couple of things I want you to know. First, for God so loved. Do you ever think about this? For, for God so loved, he, he, he loved not, not just a little bit, but a big bit. Right? The love of God is this great love, this love that we can't even comprehend. And what's amazing is that God so loved the world, knowing the world was sinful. Romans chapter 5 is an amazing chapter. Verse 8 is perfect, right? God commended or showed his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. Take some time and meditate on that, that Jesus Christ died for me knowing I was a sinner. And as you progress in your life, you start to realize how big of a sinner I really am. But not me, <laughs> you, <laughs> us. All of us, individually we understand God has sinned greatly against you. In fact, I would even tell you this morning that the closer you get to God, the more you figure out how far you were away. It is only because of God's love that I could ever get to heaven by God's grace. I also want you to know that grace flows from love. Right? God's love motivates it, but grace flows from love. It's, 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 it's this undeserved gift that God gave us at Christmas. In Ephesians chapter 2, we remember verses 8 and 9, by grace you're saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works that no one can boast. This gift of God is the greatest Christmas gift ever, Jesus Christ. And we think about Christmas and we think about all the amazing, wonderful things, but they all focus on Jesus and the salvation we have in Him because of God's grace and the Grace flows from the love. I want you to see that this love is available to all who believe. Still, in verse 16, that, 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 that God loved the world. Why? So that we could, so that we as many as believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life. This is what's amazing. Like I, I can look out here this morning. I don't know everybody's story. I don't know how each of us would approach God if we were to die today. But what I do know is that each of us in this room today, as you hear the gospel, that you just put your faith in Jesus Christ, look on the cross and live, you have an opportunity to say, God, save me. Jesus died for you. And if you would believe in him, he would save you. What does this mean for us? Look, remember the love of God this Christmas. Remember the love of God, which, which is to say to you Christ, Christians, Show that love to somebody else. Remember what God has done. Just take some time reflecting on the truth of God's love in your life. If you're not a Christian, when I say, remember the love of God this Christmas, it's remember salvation that God has offered you through Jesus Christ. Listen, as we share the love with others, the greatest way, I think, is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is why we support missions. This this morning, we didn't have a big Lottie Moon time to, to talk, but missions giving demonstrates our love for the world. This, this morning, 
If you've not been here before, the, the boxes each represent $1,000 given to international missions through Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Right now, we're up to 35 boxes. We've got some over there. We've got some there. You guys have given $35,000 for international missions. Amen? Which is to say you love God big and you want to show that love to the world, to the nations. The reason we do this, our, our picture, if you can see it, the church is giving, goes two ways. It goes cooperative program giving that's on the top. We give to our state, which helps church planting, which helps reach people in the state across North America. Part of that, 50% of it, eventually gets to the IMB budget. That's International Mission Board. What I want you to notice about Lottie Moon Christmas offering this circle here, about 31 or 32% of International Mission's budget comes through cooperative program. That's regular weekly giving nationwide. The other half or more comes from other sources. About 60% of Lottie Moon offering, the, the, the IMB budget, 60% comes from Lottie Moon Christmas offering. What does that mean when a church says, you know what, I'm going to give to Lottie Moon? 100% of that Lottie Moon Christmas offering goes to fund missions. 100% of Lottie Moon Christmas offering is like saying, you know what, I'm going to give just one more gift to international missions this year. As I plan my Christmas, I think I'm going to buy for mom or dad or kids or grandkids and for some missionary overseas. That is what Lottie Moon Christmas offering does. We show our love for the world through giving to missions. Finally, I want you to notice in the passage, love finds meaning in judgment. That's such an important point. Listen, if I was to stand before you today and say, you know what? Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sins. But it's not really a big deal because there's no judgment. <laughs> it would just take the punch out of the salvation that God has given for us. Right? Can you imagine if God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to save people from nothing? <laughs> Utterly ridiculous. But still, some people would, would go there. Again, go back with me to Numbers chapter 21. and Just thinking, right? We're not, not going to read it again. The serpents were to judge the people. And God said, I'm going to punish the rebellion that's in the camp. Because rebellion deserves to be punished. Today, God says, I'm going to punish the rebellion in the camp. In the world, rebellion, sin against God, will be punished. But I'm going to save you from that punishment, from that judgment, if you will let me. Love really finds meaning in judgment. A couple of things. First, salvation is for all who believe. Verses 17 and 18, I want you to notice in God's word, it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In other words, just like Moses raised up the pole with a snake, Jesus comes and dies on the cross. Why? So you could be saved. So I could be saved. God's purpose in sending Jesus was not judgment, but salvation. Because, verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned. You see what God is doing? He's saying, I've, I've sent my son Jesus, and if you would just look, you would live. Paul says, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. We stand before God not as those condemned, but as those free to live our life, to do things for Jesus, to to share Christ with somebody, to enjoy Christmas for what it really is. But it really means something because as much as salvation is for those who believe, condemnation is for those who do not. Right? It is point B that condemnation exists for the unbeliever that gives meaning to the fact that salvation is for those who believe. By the way, Christian, I think this is maybe one of the biggest things that should motivate us. One of the biggest things that motivates me to share Jesus with somebody. Right When I look at God's word and I see verse 17 and 18, it's, it's awesome. God, thank you. We praise you that you would save us and send Jesus that we could be saved through him. But verse 18 continues, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name, the only son of God. Just like in the camp of Israel, 
All those people bitten with snakes. They're already condemned before God. They're going to die. Salvation has come so that we can live, but if we don't look to Christ and live, we will surely die. This morning, receive Christ that you might live. For not, look, I don't know where you are. I don't know if this is the first time or the twelfth time you've heard the gospel. Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross to take my place, a substitutionary death. He was buried, rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven, and he's coming back to judge both living and dead. This morning, you stand condemned before God because you've rebelled against him. Each of us deserves a sinner's death. Jesus Christ took that. And if you would say to God, God, I believe in you. Today I'm looking at the cross so that I could be saved. He would save you. So we come to our time of response. This is it. This is what I want from you. If you've not received Christ today, let me show you in God's word how you can go home today with eternal life. For those of you who have received Christ, take this time to love Christ, just to worship him, to love somebody else in the name of Jesus Christ. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray together. Please stand as we pray that we won't respond easily. Father God, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for the salvation that we have in him. Father, I just pray for the men and women in this room who are unsure of their eternal salvation. God, I pray that they would make that profession of faith public today. Lord, that they might go home today in the freedom of Christ. Truly understanding Christmas. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As the music plays, you respond.